I think, you know, one, you don't want to repeat yourself. You're pretty aware of what you've written, mm -hmm. but there are some things, sometimes there's one little thing that you'll put in a script that then falls out and it'll be in the back of your head forever. Like, I, you know, it, it doesn't work in today's world, but when I first started out writing, I wanted to write a story about a character who liked to go to airport bars and drink. Mm -hmm. And back then, it was when you could go to the gates, you could pick up people, there was no TSA and all that stuff. And in just the psychology behind someone who couldn't travel himself or was afraid to travel, I don't know, but who liked to watch people going and coming. And so, you know, that's one of those things that's hanging out there that at some point may resurrect itself and morph into something else. But I think when, I think you should always, you always have to challenge yourself. Um, and if you find yourself writing something where it's go, yeah, 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 I can't wait to get to this part, then you've got to focus back on the prior um, okay. because it's not, it's not good enough. Um, there are certain recycling things that, that aren't necessarily bad. You know, there are, uh, you know, tropes that are perhaps underused or haven't been overexposed that, you know, that always work. This, you know, this always works. And, you know, I think it was Flannery O'Connor or somebody who said there, there are only 12 stories and we keep retelling them as though they'd never been told before. So I think there's a familiarity, especially from a Western civilization stories telling standpoint to recycle stories. Mm -hmm. We come across things that are familiar, whether, you know, when you're reading Joseph Campbell or something, and the different, the different steps, uh, you know, that a hero, a hero's journey, um, you immediately recognize, you go, okay, and I can name, you know, on this chapter, this is the next step of the hero's journey. I can name 40 movies just off the top of my head where this happened. Now there are variations on that, but so I think that, yes, you want to make sure that you don't repeat yourself um, as much as you're able. And, um, and don't be lazy, but also understand that there are some tropes that work for a reason. A script is just more than anything, you know, a lovely br blueprint for a building you're going to build. And there are going to be adjustments along the way, or even as you're building it, you go, this was the most fantastic architectural plan I've ever seen. But now that I think of it, I think we need a bathroom on the first floor, you know, and then you go, oh, well, we, well you know, you have to adjust to things. The, the world changes and you've got to adjust to everything all the time, see what the day will give you. Um, so I understood that because I had had movies made with other people directing and seeing how they changed somewhat tonally sometimes, sometimes a line of dialogue. Clint Eastwood was very good to me. He let me be on the set for the entire making of A Perfect World. He had just won an Oscar for Unforgiven. Kevin Costner had just won an Oscar for Dances with Wolves, directing Dances with Wolves. So I had two Academy Award winning directors on the set with me and both of them were open to me asking thousands of questions. Clint's answers were usually yes and no, but Kevin would go on and on and on. Um, but the first movie that I directed, The Rookie, uh, was one that I didn't write. I wanted to, it was a script that was sent to me by Mark Johnson, who produced A Perfect World, who said, there's a guy in Portland, Oregon that wrote a, a story, and it's a true story, and it's sports in West Texas, and he's from Portland, and I'm from Spain, so can you read this and let me know if this feels authentic? And I read the script, and I really liked it. I thought Mike Rich did a beautiful job. He'd obviously spent time down there and captured how West Texans talk, how Texans move. It just smelled right, everything about it. And so Mark Johnson, who's a clever producer, said, you know what, I know you've, been, you, you've got a couple of things you're supposed to direct. You should direct this movie. And I went, well, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct something that I write because I'll have a leg up on it and really understand where all the bodies are buried and what I need to accomplish. And it'll, it'll give me a leg up in, in, in directing this first time because I was worried about getting fired after a week. And he said, well, you've proven that you can go into a room and sell a script um, and you can write, but you haven't gone in an audition as a, as a director yet. And I think it'd be good practice for you. And I thought, well, that actually is good advice. So I read the script three or four times, went into Disney, 
and uh, said, here's, uh, the script's great. Here's how I would shoot this. Here's what I'm thinking about thematically. Here's the film, I would, the film stock I would use. I mean, I was overprepared. And I was there for an hour and uh, they said, thank you. And so I left. And before I got home, Mark Johnson called me and said, you got the job. And I went, what? And he goes, yeah. They said, this is a big risk because you hadn't directed before, but they felt like you were the guy, the right guy for it. So anyway, back to your question, it was a real blessing for me to have to interpret a script. And most of it stayed exactly the same, but I worked with the writer, Mike Rich, during prep as we kind of morphed it into something. We'd lean into certain things and pull back on other things but also locations. You'd have a location that's in the script is one thing, and you go, you know what? I think this would be better. I know it's supposed to take place here. I think this would be better outside. Or sometimes, just from a production standpoint, you go, I know it says this takes place in a high school gymnasium, but this is a certain day when we have to have a company move. We're shooting one place in the morning, one place in the afternoon, and there are no gymnasiums within five miles of our first location. So where, where else can we find a shoot? Just those kinds of things. And you lean in themes and things like that. So I was forced to interpret. What that led to was being able to look at a script, whether I wrote it or somebody else wrote it, and say, you get to certain things and go, who wrote this shit? Even when it's you. And that's a valuable thing to have, to be able to go, my job is to interpret. And I think film is very collaborative. As much as I will say the director is far and away the most important person, their mark is on. Their thumbprint and DNA is all over it. Not to say that the script isn't vitally important because it is, but um, the script is really a signature and um, you know, a, a DNA and a fingerprint of the, of the director, for better or worse, it's just the way it is. But it's a collaborative process. And I think every, along the way, everybody's job is to interpret what came before. You know, the screenwriter, uh, in Mike Rich's case, was interpreting uh, newspaper articles, and interviews and gleaning from that, how to put this document together. I was working on that and interpreting it in, as a film. The editor comes along, and even though I'm working with the editor nonstop, and they're my choices, I mean, we're looking at stuff together and trying. I want him or her to interpret the footage. And sometimes they'll come up with stuff, and I go, I never would have cut that that way, but you're right. So I think having everybody interpret every step of the way is important. And I think that that was a valuable lesson for me because I think had I directed the thing, something I'd written, I might have been too earnest in keeping with the text as opposed to being able to go distance myself from it. So I, I think you have to, they're two very different hats. And I, and you know, sometimes when like the little things, the script I just, movie I just made, I, you know, wrote and directed it, but I had to be able to wear both hats. Even you have a certain shorthand sometimes when a scene's not working and, you know, you go, why isn't this working? And you go, well, because the script didn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. So let's sit down. Let's change this right now. What if you say this and then you say this, we add this line, you know, so it helps to be able to put that hat on really quickly and go into writer mode. But I think it's really important to be able to separate the two. I have a, I think that, you know, people, when I first started out, um, you couldn't look, you couldn't find screenplays to read. Yeah. There were, the movies existed, there weren't even VHSs of the tapes or anything. So uh, there were no screenplay books, how to write a screenplay. There was one, Sid Field uh, had a book, a little book. Um, that was the only one that was out. Um, so learning, you know, kind of a three act or a five act structure or kind of what your structure was regardless of acts, um, understanding how to write characters. But it's a little like, it's a little like, okay, I'm gonna learn all the chords on a guitar because I wanna write songs, which is awesome. And you learn all the chords and you can play them and you can play a song. It doesn't mean you're ready for Carnegie Hall and to do it professionally. It just means, no, I can craft a song here. Um, you know, because it starts to become, as musicians say, the difference between good and great musicians is what you do between the notes. And I think as a writer, you start off, because one, it's a crazy foreign format for writers to look at a screenplay. 
and it takes a while. I think it takes a couple of scripts before the format starts working for you, or at least you're working in concert. I think at the start, it's like trying to figure out how to make it look like a screenplay with my action, my dialogue, my words. And it's a struggle. And that's why I think that it's, it can take three or four screenplays before all of a sudden you're making it work for you. And by work for you, I mean this. I think when you read a screenplay, it should be back in the olden days when they had film projected through theaters at the movies, it was 24 frames per second, right? Yes, sir. And um, your eyes, and it was built around the idea, Walter Murch has a whole book on this, about when we blink, when we look at stuff, how we look at stuff, and that goes into lens selection and editorial style and things like that. But the idea is that when the kind of when do you blink, and in some ways, 24 times a second, we're, we're flickering and your eyes are dancing on an image that appears to be constant. And I think when you're reading a screenplay, you should be able to see the movie in your head and you should read it in a way that your eyes are dancing on the page, which means you don't want to have it be a page of dense description. No one's going to read it because yes. your eyes are not going to dance on the page. That's a book, you know, do that. I think that when you're writing, for instance, as a young writer, I might be describing um, a Hollywood apartment. And I would go, you know, interior Hollywood apartment, Ted's, Ted's Hollywood apartment day. And then you have, you know, your description of it. And I might have a whole paragraph talking about what he had on the walls, um, his couch, uh, the, the, the tears in the carpet, the, the, the paint chips on the wall, whatever. I would describe all that and it would be really well written. And it took me a while to figure out that what this should be is an interactive experience with the reader. It's not you talking down to the reader and planting this in the reader's brain. It's an interactive experience with the reader using his or her uh, knowledge of the story and what they think Ted's apartment looks like. Now you want to head them in a direction. And so there was, one perfect example in a, I think it was a Joe Esther house, you know, screenplay or something, but it was like, interior, Ted's apartment, night, shitty, period. Every single reader looks at that and has their own idea of what Ted's shitty apartment looks like. Now, you don't have to yeah. just say that. You could say a one, a one room efficiency that has it, that no one's cleaned in a month, you know, whatever but just short little blast of things like that and breaking it up on the page so that there's space on the page so your eyes are dancing. Um, and I think that's, that was, that's something that's just, you just have to learn. You'll get to the point where all of a sudden the format is working for you and you enjoy the format.